Let's move on to the next item, which is the uh, call to action bill. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it, it, this draws directly on from uh, <coughs> David's presentation. He talked about the call to action. Uh, w w one of our prime duties in the legislation, of course, is to promote a comprehensive NHS, and that's not just for now, that, that's into the future, and that's what our strategy process I is about. Um, I won't go through the paper in detail, nor the call to action itself, because I think when we launched it last Thursday, uh, it, it, it got a good deal of prominence and, and indeed quite a lot of support for its approach. I do want to just pick out four, four points. I think the first is the, the message at the heart of the call to action analysis is that doing nothing is not an option. I know the Institute for Fiscal Studies have just published their latest uh, report on the economic outlook, and they're reinforcing some of the messages in the call to action about the uh, state of public finances going forward, uh, not going to suddenly open up and become uh, much easier, much more generous. And I think in a number of the debates we've heard around that and around other, other long-term economic projections. People who have identified uh, you know, a set of trade-offs for public services. Are we going to look to reduce entitlements? Are we going to look to increase charging? Are we prepared to drop standards in particular, in particular areas? And NHS England in its call to action is saying none of those are acceptable options to us. They do not fit with our values, they do not fit with our mission for serving patients and population in this country. So that leaves us um, in the place described by this piece of work, which is we need to be able to identify the right changes in the interests of patients, in the interests of communities, and be able to bring about those changes at an accelerated rate. And that leads, I think, to the second point I draw out, which is how you go about that. And I think that's only through a process of really honest, open engagement involvement. So while we've set out the analysis last Thursday, that's just the start <coughs> of a process we want to see right the way across the country, where our partners in health and wellbeing boards, where patients, the public, uh, voluntary groups, charitable groups are all deeply involved in sharing with us their understanding of what great health systems should be looking like over the next five to ten years. And it's through that process of involvement engagement that I think we'll be able uh, then to respond more swiftly, maybe than the health system's been able to do previously. I think the third point that gives gives me quite a lot of confidence in this, is the nature of support we've had from many of our partners nationally. So I know in the paper which we wrote a little bit before we published, uh, we published Call to Action itself, we, we name check a number of our national partners. In, in, in the final tally, every single one of the health system partners uh, signed up. They wanted their names to be associated uh, with, this, with this work. Uh, but also local government, represented by local government association, and I think really importantly the clinical commissioning groups across the country through their representatives. <coughs> so this is a very broadly owned, uh, you know, mission to identify uh, a vision for the NHS in five to ten years, which leads to I think my last point, which is that th this won't be just about um, interesting ideas and. Uh, you, you know, good conversations. This will lead to planning and will have a traction which will help us actually deliver those changes. That's both at the level of clinical commissioning groups and health and wellbeing boards where we will be looking uh, through the end of this to come up with, uh, with real plans, real plans for change. And similarly for us as the NHS England Commissioner for the way we commission primary care, for the way we commission specialised services, for the whole range of work we can do around incentives and uh, financial change, but also uh, in the area of transparency. And that whole relationship between 
citizens and service uh, that Tim and his team, I, th I think, are leading in, in really quite an innovative and exciting way. We'll be setting out uh, real plans for how we make that real over the next five years. So I, I, I would commend this uh, to the board, but to note this is just the start of, of a very significant process of engagement over the coming months. Thank you, Bill. I think, um, I think all the board recognises that this is <coughs> essential, but also there's going to be a very tough exercise. Uh, we've got a, a good consensus uh, around us for the case for change. Uh, maintaining that consensus as we go through to examining options is going to be a real challenge. It's going to be essential, I think, that we engage clinicians and frontline delivery uh, people right, right across the NHS to help us to envisage this, because it, 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 it will affect how the whole service looks in 10 years. It will affect what we can do for the public. It will affect the empowerment of patients and a huge emphasis on prevention and the public health agenda are all tied in together. Um, but what it does most of all is disrupt uh, the existing set of expectations. It's not a structural change. We have to work within existing structures, but we also have to be able, as a board, I think, to ensure that there is sufficient commitment and stability over time so that people can see a direction of travel, a convergence of, uh, of support around that if we have any chance of uh, maintaining the highest quality healthcare system in these adverse financial circumstances. So let me invite um, comments, if I may, from uh, members of the board. Uh, Moira Gibb. Welcome, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think David um, made reference to other health systems, as it were. Is there going to be an international pers perspective to this work? And are there examples? Because often when the NHS is discussed, it's in terms of not comparing well, whereas actually I think it compares very well. But are there examples of where, um, uh, of what's happened in other places that we will bring into this uh, discussion. Personally, I think it's quite difficult, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, considering myself as a patient in these circumstances rather than um, uh, in any other capacity to think differently unless you kind of see examples and giving people opportunities to see what's happening and how things have changed elsewhere might be very valuable. Yes, I think that's absolutely right Moira the uh, two points on that I, th I think probably the most respected think tank who compare different health systems is the Commonwealth Foundation which is based in it's based in the states in Washington and they take a, a number of the developed nations they look at the health systems and they try to compare against a set of criteria so efficiency effectiveness quality and outcomes um, consistently, the NHS rates very highly in the in the top two. I think in the last in the last three comparisons they've done. So that's um, a, you know to one extent that, that that's great news for us. That that, that really does validate um, you know some of the excellence across the NHS. Um, but we do know that there are elements where where we can learn. The Lancet article several months ago compared some of the outcomes in particular clinical areas where we can we can improve and we must improve. So as well as feeding in some of that, uh, you know, data and analysis, we're proposing this autumn to bring together what we're calling a symposium of some of the expert think tanks, some um, some other organisations who've got experience of working both in this country and abroad and bring them together into one place to describe from that experience, from that learning, uh, what they think uh, a, a, a great NHS might look like in, in 10 years' time. So we, we, we think just bringing some of that thought leadership, different exchange of ideas, uh, will be a really good way to challenge us at the time that we're doing our own planning. Maggie. Uh, just two, two comments, Bill. One is, um, I thought the document was excellent, and I think setting out the really big things that need to be addressed to, to make the whole equation work is, is really critical. The, the two things I wanted to just um, uh, uh, make a point about, one is 
How do you translate this? I mean, you talked about the things we may do over the coming months. I mean, the concern I have is that um, we have a debate about the long term, but we don't have actions that we're taking that take us on a path for the long term. So over the course of the next six months, what is it that we actually do with this? And the second thing, which is sort of related to that, is if we now look at every decision we're taking that's incremental, so if, for example, we're looking at um, uh, the next year's plans in different areas, how do we start to already take on board the direction of travel in the decisions we make? That's the thing I was kind of struggling with. Yeah, the, I think I've probably got the same answer to both of those questions, Nagib. Where the, um, I'll, I'll be quite cartoonish in this because it wouldn't be fair everywhere, but <coughs> at, at times in the NHS we've, we, we, we've planned very incrementally. So we've thought, how are things now? What's next year's money going to look like? How, how can we make some improvements, keep our head above water, and we're, and we're always looking at that short term. The, the idea here is we put that planning in the context of where we want to be in five to ten years' time. Now, that, 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 that will only really make a difference than if we connect it back into our planning processes. So, you know, while we'll have the visioning, we'll have the challenge, we'll have the what should services look, five to ten years out, we'll follow that up with, with, with the proper planning cycle. So we'll be working with people to say, well, if that's where you want to be, well, what are the steps you're taking next year? And what are the steps you plan to take two years out? We'd expect you know, pr pr pretty hard specific actions backed up by um, the commissioning intentions, backed up by the sorts of collaboration with partners that will be needed to bring about the change. So this isn't just about um, a, a, a ethereal vision some way out. Um, it provides the context against the, uh, the, the, the really specific planning to get there over the next few years. I mean, the two things that sort of strike me, usually when you make big changes, Either you've got some combination of you have to spend more in the short term to create the change to enable you to be able to do something differently, or in order to do something differently or shift resources, you've got to do some less of something else. Do you have concerns about those two things? The you know is there an investment to create the capacity or a reduction in something in order to do it? Yeah, I would be, I mean, Paul may wish to comment, but I'd, I'd, I'd be very surprised if that strand of work, which we've called um, incentives and financial incentives for change, if that didn't get feedback from um, both nationally but also our local partners, which says we're not sure there are the right incentives, the right mechanisms to promote and support change at the pace we need. So I would have thought that is an area where we might need to be quite innovative. But Paul. I think I'd just make two, two links for you, Nagy, one of which is to the, to the uh, incentives and business model strands that we're doing, where I think we will really give some thought to the specific question you ask, which is what's the transitional cost to get from where we are today to where we want to be, and how do we make the funds flow to do that? Um, much more concretely, and without wishing to bring forward an agenda item which comes later in the in the meeting, uh, there is the response to the spending review, which in my mind has brought forward very much the very focused discussion we need to have about how do we make that transition, how do we use investment money, but first of all, how do we create investment money? And if I can just signal forward now to, I don't know where it is on the agenda, a few, a few minutes' time, uh, I'll, I'll directly address the, the topic that you've, that you've raised in that context. Okay, may, may we return then to Nagib's point when we reach that item in the agenda, because the spending review is a spur uh, for, for carrying out some of this work. Um, let me then move on. I'm sorry, Victor. It's okay. It's just a, a, a question, really. But uh, first of all, welcoming the fact that you are 
making particular effort to hear the voices of people who generally aren't heard in consultations like this. But it's more a question because Nagib's point is a um, there is the you can do you can stop doing something, you can do less of something, or you can radically change something. And I just wonder, you know, you can redesign it. And I just wonder what you think the appetite is for that, and, and how we're going to know that those voices that we aren't normally heard are actually influencing the outcome. Well, confused, but my view is NHS England has absolutely got that appetite, and that flows directly from an analysis which tells us that if we don't, you know pursue some fairly radical redesign and change in the interests of patients, communities, particularly those who perhaps haven't, you know, haven't fared so well in the past, have been at risk of getting left out, then uh, we, we get into that debate which in, in our values has been very unpalatable. You know, it, it's, it's absolutely not where we want to go, which is, well, you know, what, what do you pair back on or what, do you, what standards are you prepared to compromise? And I think this is a very clear statement that uh, we're not into that area of compromise and cutting back. We're into the area of radical change in the interests of patients. Okay. Ed. I, would, I would just back that up by saying the whole design of this, and looking five to ten years out, and the stakeholder participation that is absolutely integral to the success of this, should enable us to, to really reimagine parts of, of, of it. So it's, it's go beyond redesign to reimagining the whole construct of, of, of how services are delivered because the front line and the consultation processes will start to bring some of that out. what commissioning actually is as opposed to what it has become in my view, which I think is a very powerful intervention. And how to make it work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's been a very interesting um, review. Um, thank you, Bill. Uh, we will expect to come back to the board on several occasions over the coming months with updates and um, also real engagement by all members of the board, non-executives as much as executives. I mean, this is something which we all own, which we all wish to succeed.